Hello and welcome to this discussion on how to tackle low productivity and growth. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, Director of the Institute for Government. We've got a lot to talk about. It is not a new question. Uh, it is one that is still hotly contested. The causes and the solutions. We've had some very good questions sent in on this as well. Thank you very much indeed for that. So I'm delighted to have here two excellent panellists. I'm not going to call them contestants. We have David Sainsbury, who is the author of this new book, Windows of Opportunity, How Nations Create Wealth, which speaks exactly to these questions. And he was, uh, for eight years, Minister of Science and Innovation in Tony Blair's government, and in 2015 led an independent panel arguing for a radical reform of the UK's technical education, which I think I can say has, has had some impact and is, is, is being put into practice. And he is, of course, Chancellor of Cambridge University and the founder and chairman of the Institute for Government, drawing on some of his frustrations in government and why it might work more effectively. We also have with us Ed Balls, a senior fellow at the Harvard University's Kennedy School and uh, was a Secretary of State in Gordon Brown's government and former shadow chancellor and is of course as well a visiting professor at King's College and we're delighted to have worked with King's College on putting this all together. Well we're going to kick off with David Sainsbury setting out uh, some ideas from his book in a presentation and then Ed Balls is going to respond to him and then we're going to tease apart the ideas that they've both put up there. So with that, uh, very warm welcome and David Sainsbury, uh, please, please go ahead. In the UK, we are today faced with a very alarming situation. In the period between 2010 and 2019, we had a very poor record of growth, with the annualised rate of growth of output per hour averaging just 0.4%. And the pandemic has, of course, made the situation worse. At the same time, the economists who advise the government have not been able to explain why our rate of growth has been so low referring to it as a productivity puzzle. In fact, in recent weeks, the government has put £34 million into a productivity institute to try and find out why the UK has a low rate of economic growth. In circumstances where we could be heading towards a decline in the country's GDP, I do not think we can afford to wait for the economics profession to spend a couple of years finding out why our rate of productivity and growth is so low. I therefore want this morning to show how a simple analysis of our GDP figures gives a high-level explanation of why our growth rate is low and what we need to do to improve it. Before I explain why the growth rate of the UK has been very poor, there is one technical issue which is important to understand. When economists talk about the productivity of the economy, they're not talking about production efficiency, as most business people think. They're not talking about the number of man hours used to produce the economy's output. What they're talking about is the value added per hour of firms in the economy, inflation adjusted. This is important because the value added per hour of a firm depends not only on its production efficiency, but it also its innovation and competitive advantage in the marketplace and the price it can charge its customers. So why can't economists explain our slow rate of growth? The answer is they can't because in most cases their thinking is based on a mathematical model of growth which has built into it three assumptions which are completely unrealistic. They are that the capabilities of firms don't matter and that we can think in terms of the representative firm. That firms are managed by rational managers and that consequently entrepreneurs play no part. And that we're dealing with perfectly competitive markets where everyone is selling the same product at the same price. In such a world, the only variable left is the overall efficiency of the market and as a result, the value added per hour of all sectors is assumed to be the same. In my book, Windows of Opportunity, How Nations Create Wealth, on the other hand, I put forward a production capability theory 
of economic growth, which is based on the idea that the value added per hour of the firms in the different sectors of the economy varies because it reflects the performance of the firms in terms of innovation and competitive advantage. If we look at the performance of the different sectors of the UK economy during the period 2000 to 2019, as shown on this chart, this is clearly the case. The chart also shows that the poor growth record of the economy, and indeed the poor productivity, can be explained by what happened in the different sectors of the economy and the shift of economic activity between them. What the data in the chart shows is that the slow growth of the economy was due to the performance of three major sectors of the economy, manufacturing, financial services, and oil and gas, and a shift in economic activities from the high value added sectors to low value added sectors as shown by a negative between effect of minus 2.4%. In the case of manufacturing, it suffered a fall in GVA from £55.73 uh, to £52.20 pence, and also saw a fall in its percentage share of total GVA from 10.64% to 9.65%. This was caused by firms in foreign countries rapidly innovating and increasing the competitive advantage of their manufacturing industries faster than our manufacturing industries were doing. In the case of financial services, which is one of the UK's high value added services, the GVA per hour grew by 3.4% between 2010 and 2019, but as a percentage of the country's total GVA, it fell from 5.44% to 3.99%. The average revenues of the leading listed four UK banks fell by 17% between 2010 and 2019, as lower aggregate demand in the economy resulted in less demand for financial products. In addition, many of the financial products which had flourished in the boom conditions leading up to the financial crash were seen to have little economic value after the crash. Finally, the oil and gas sector saw a fall in GVA per hour from an amazing £681 per hour to 546 GVA per hour, while its percentage share of the country's GVA fell from 1.51% to 0.72%. The latter figure was due to the fall of GVA per hour and a fall in, G in output by a quarter from the end of 2010 to the end of 2019. Output is predicted to fall further in the future and downward pressure on the oil price because of the growth of renewable energy and the relative uncompetitive nature of our sector due to higher extraction costs means there's very little chance of the sector stimulating UK productivity growth in the future. It is, I think, surprising in view of its importance for the national growth figures that so little attention has been paid by economists to the impact of North Sea oil. In summary, the reason we've had a slow rate of productivity growth is that because of global competition, the high value added per capita sectors of our economy are today a smaller share of our economy than in 2000. And the only way we can improve our rate of growth is by increasing the innovation and competitive advantage of the high value added per capita sectors of our economy. It has been argued that what we need to do is to improve the productivity and therefore the value added per capita of our low value added services. This however I believe is wrong because it's based on a misconception that these are businesses which could be high value added businesses if they were well managed but in reality, they are not. They are businesses like retailing, restaurants, hairdressing, hotels and news agents, which do a very important job for society, but where it's very difficult to create a competitive advantage and therefore achieve a high level of value added. Increasing the innovation and competitive advantage of our high value added per capita businesses will, I, uh, will require, I believe, 
the government to bring forward new policies in four key areas. These are technical education, the regional level in up agenda, corporate governance, and R&D and innovation. In the area of technical education, I think there is already extremely uh, valuable program of work being rolled out, but I am obviously biased having been involved in the design of it. In the area of R&D and innovation, there is also a lot of excellent policies being developed, though I'm not sure that the role of, that DARPA plays in the USA is well understood. Also, our program for di diffusing the new techniques of Industry 4 to companies is extremely poor. In the other two areas, however, corporate governance and the levelling up agenda, new policies need to be developed. I also want to make the point that the production capability theory of economic growth, which I've outlined in my book, has implications for the regional levelling up agenda of the government. There are substantial regional differences uh, in wealth in the UK. But as the work for the of the Centre for Cities has shown, this divide is not simply due to geography. It's not due to workers in the north working less hard than the south or being less efficient. Nor is it the case that all cities in the north are less prosperous than those in the south. It is on the contrary due to the ability of cities in different parts of the country to respond to economic change and reinvent themselves. Government policies in the past, which have explicitly attempted to reduce the north-south divide, and which can be traced back to 1930s, have not been effective because the majority of interventions have tended to reinforce the existing industrial structure by supporting low-knowledge routine activities to reduce unemployment, as opposed to supporting the reinvention of cities by increasing the number of knowledge-intensive businesses in them. As a result, in many cities in the north, jobs in declining industries have been replaced by low-skilled routine jobs, which are vulnerable to foreign competition and technological change. Cotton mills and dockyards have been replaced by call centres and distribution sheds. What we need to do now urgently is create more high-value-added per capita firms and jobs in the poorer regions of the country. The levelling up of the poorer regions of the country, I therefore believe, will require the government to devolve more power in the areas of skills and transport to the mayoral combined authorities, and also increase and improve the Strength in Places Fund so that it can support the growth of more high-value-added clusters and jobs in the low economic regions of the country. Finally, I think that the development of the policies have I outlined will not be an easy task. Ministers will need to make use of all the data they have and think creatively. They'll also need to avoid the temptation to turn to the remedies of the past and give ever greater incentives to managers, reduce regulations, or turn more areas of our society into markets. Such policies have their place, but in most cases their value has long ago been exhausted. Instead, ministers will need to focus specifically on policies to create more firms selling high-value-added services and products in global markets in competition with foreign firms. And that is a tough task, but I believe a doable one. Ed Balls is now going to give his response to David Sainsbury's opening presentation. So let me start by saying this is an excellent book. After a hugely disappointing decade of weak growth, even weaker productivity growth, and widening economic and political divides, the book is a call to arms to policymakers to try harder to understand the true drivers of productivity, growth, and prosperity, skills, innovation, and the way firms can develop competitive advantage, and to put that understanding to good use, both to boost prosperity and to close the regional divides. This is a vital challenge, which, makes, uh, uh, which is even more vital, um, given that the current way, the COVID economic crisis, is, um, um, is challenging us all. It should be required reading for Cabinet 
and aspiring cabinet ministers alike, and not just in the UK, because the reach of the book's analysis and case studies covers not just 300 years of history, but every region of the globe. The book is analytic, it's historically aware, it's challenging to conventional thinking, it's highly critical of past mistakes, but also thoughtfully constructive about what can be done. And none of that will be a surprise to any of us who've worked with Lord David Sainsbury over past years and decades. The reason why the book draws upon such a depth of both historical business and government experience is because David has lived that experience himself. His deep commitment to putting that experience to work, and at times his frustrations too, shine through every page. And having discussed these issues at length with David during our work back in 2014 on the Inclusive Prosperity Commission, which I chaired with Larry Summers, his warnings at the end of the book about the dangers of slower, uh, of slower growth and widening inequality for politics and social cohesion and populism in the years to come are very well made. I will admit I did have some worries at the start of the book, when he basically rips into pretty much the entire past history of the economics profession and its understanding of the drivers of economic growth. But on reflection, and I'm not sure David is fully going to like what I'm about to say, in my view, his understanding of the way in which markets and the growth process works, as set out in his book, pretty well reflect the consensus today amongst modern mainstream economics. Indeed, the profession was already moving in David's direction back in the late 1980s, when I was at Harvard studying economics, critiquing the restrictive assumptions of the solo growth model, what David calls neoclassical economics, in which growth is, is driven by levels of investment and population growth, and some exogenous and therefore under-analyzed factor called technological progress. I hesitate to use the words neoclassical in any public setting, uh, especially post-neoclassical, because that phrase, post-neoclassical endogenous growth theory, included in Gordon Brown's 1994 speech at Labour's economic conference called New Policies for a New Global Economy, which was, um, which was held just a few months after Tony Blair became Labour leader, got me into some hot water, also into Michael Heseltine's It's Not Brown's, It's Ball's Conservative Party conference speech. But the key insight of endogenous growth theory was that the contribution of technological progress wasn't preordained, it wasn't exogenous. It actually defend, depended on how firms are led and finance and compete, the skills of the workforce, and the wider legal and policy, and policy context set by government. Indeed, if you read the full Gordon Brown quote from the 94 speech, which incidentally I tried to cut, and Gordon insisted on putting back the night before he delivered it, our new economic approach is rooted in ideas which stress the importance of macroeconomics, post-neoclassical endogenous growth theory, and the symbiotic relationship between growth and investment and people and infrastructure. And there you have, if you throw innovation in two, a statement which is, I think, pretty close to the heart of David's growth analysis that we've heard today and which is in the book. It was, I think, our emerging understanding of how markets work, how they interact with entrepreneurs, companies, and the skills of the workforce, the way that drives growth, which led Gordon Brown to deliver very lengthy sections on enterprise and entrepreneurship in his budget speeches, but also to reforms such as strengthening and then making competition policy independent, the huge increase in the investment in science after 1997, introducing the, re the research and development tax credit and establishing the technology strategy board, uh, the, the setting up and funding of the regional development agencies, um, and the detailed reforms which flowed from reviews such as Miners, Crookshank, Higgs and Lambert into financial intermediation, competition and banking, corporate governance and university business links. Reforms, many of which David worked closely on as a business minister. And in his book, his praise for the Treasury Ginger Group, the Enterprise and Growth Unit, led back then by John Kingman, and his work on competition science and innovation policy is well made. A lot of that thinking was shaped by David as a minister in the government. Of course, that government also made mistakes, uh, ducking the challenge of Tomlinson on qualification reform, 
not being bolder on infrastructure reform, um, uh, not being bolder on the level of adult skills, but also failing to give powers to regions to, to enact um, and, and shape that spending. And then, of course, um, the failures of financial regulation, which happened in Britain and all around the world in the middle of, the, um, of the, that 2000 decade. And those failures are important because there's a further insight in David's book, um, an insight which I believe we and the Treasury Growth Unit also shared, and which we all have to continually learn and relearn. Yes, the, dynamis, the, the, uh, yes, the dynamism and innovation of markets are vital for growth. Yes, the role of government is also vital to make markets work better and in the public interest, but governments can also fail too. They can try to do the wrong things. That can end up depressing growth. That's why one of the great advocates of endogenous growth theory in the early 90s was the Chicago and Harvard economist Robert Barrow, who was, to say the least, a government sceptic. And in David, in his book, certainly does not fall into the trap of thinking that governments always get things right, not just in policy, but in its approach to growth in the economy. His concerns about government overreach and the dangers of vested interests capturing government and policy also shine through. His view that government support should be about enabling rather than directing, not government picking winners or picking winning products or companies, but supporting sector leadership. And his view that infant industry arguments for supporting nascent manufacturing capacity in developing countries can quickly be and should not be allowed to be taken over to justify rich country protectionism. Both correct insights, in my view, not always shared by other business experienced policy commentators. As Adam Smith, one of David's least favourite economists in the early part of the book, says in The Wealth of Nation, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends up conspiring against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. That is an insight of the market efficiency school, which may believe too much in the invisible hand and hadn't understood the importance of the role of government in driving the growth and innovation process, but it's an important insight nonetheless and an insight which I believe we and David share. What really strikes me though about David's book is his relentless pursuit of better outcomes for the future. And after a global financial crisis and the hugely disappointing decade of growth and productivity we've seen since then, in the UK, around the world, but particularly in the UK, we do need new ideas and policies. And the reality is, I think economics is still puzzled by what's happened to to productivity. Yes, we see um, a decline in productivity and value added in financial services, but that is across manufacturing too. The early evidence seems to be that this has happened um, in the high performing firms within individual sectors as well. There was clearly some labour hoarding uh, and growth of services in the early part of the uh, decade, which helps explain this uh, too. But um, at the moment, I don't think we still fully understand what is going on. Um, I, uh, I read a quote from Martin Wolf in the Financial Times um, who, um, who says, the good news is that with a lower rate of growth of employment in the future, it's likely productivity will rise somewhat. Since one explanation for the productivity stagnation was the lower marginal productive labour in a rapidly growing labour force, but that will not be enough to generate a rapid rise in overall productivity. Higher private and public investment and more dynamic innovation competition will also be needed. In a country damaged by the coming Brexit shock, um, that is going to be a huge challenge. Will it be met? It will, be a great, uh, it will take a great deal of intelligent and determined effort to do so. And what David's book does is set out in four areas the kind of intelligent and determined effort that we are going to, um, to see in skills and technolog technology education, in R&D and, in, in, and innovation, in corporate governance, and in regions and levelling up. I won't talk in detail about all of those because you need to buy the book. But on the first, David has made a huge contribution, in particular in recent years, again, around technical education, um, with new qualifications and speeches by the Prime Minister in recent weeks reflecting the report he did in 2016. Will the funding be adequate? Will, in the end, the new qualifications be enough to overcome the old stigma between academic and technical roots? I think the jury is still out. But David is still driving that debate forward, and that is very important. 
I also agree with his um, reflections around regional policy, although I would just add one different dimension, which is if you look in the divides in our country in terms of prosperity, productivity, and also how that is reflected in people's voting, the growing divide is not simply between London, a global city, and the rest. It's also been between the cities of our country and the towns and, and, uh, and uh, a non-urban city areas. The reality was a lot of the old manufacturing David refers to was not city-based. It was in the towns around the cities. Over the last 20 years, many of those cities have prospered and moved forward. Think of Manchester, think of Leeds, and moved into many of the sectors that David advocates they move into. But it's actually the areas outside the cities which have fallen behind increasingly. And in my view, moving from a world where you look across the region and simply focus on city leadership has the risk of missing the areas which are falling behind and where the economic and political challenge to give them new chances and new opportunities is still to be properly grasped. One final point I would just make uh, before we get into the discussion. The other thing which really strikes a chord with me in David's book is his frustration at the chopping and churning and changing of policy from one parliament to another. As he says, nationalise, privatise, nationalise. Or scrap the agency, set a new one up, is it more than a rename? Outsource this, outsource that. And um, I understand that frustration. In fact, one of the things that I've reflected upon since being in government for all of those years is that although there's, there's always debate and there's always division, the only things which actually last and make a difference are the things which become consensual, which become part of what is shared across the country, across parliaments, across parties. At moments of change, there is often debate and argument. The Conservatives voted against Bank of England independence in 1997-98 and against the national minimum wage, but they have now become part of the consensus. Think of the astonishing achievement, the forging of consensus in pensions reform, but in other areas, we, have, we failed to build a, a lasting consensus which lasts beyond parliaments and across parties. And I think David is right. We need to do better. We don't need to think simply about the right policy, but how we can come together as a country and forge consensus which, which last in terms of the policies we pursue, but also the way in which we uh, go about them. When I came out of Parliament in 2015, I sat in a Harvard hotel room um, during the Conservative Party conference to discover that George Osborne was announcing to the, con to the Conservative Party faithful the setting up of an independent infrastructure commission to report directly to, to Parliament, um, something which I had spent the last five years advocating, something which he showed absolutely no interest in at all, and once I'd gone, he announced it, and there's part of me which thought, that's a bit unfair. But then I thought, actually, in the end, if this becomes part of the consensus that we need to plan long-term for our infrastructure, it doesn't, mind, it doesn't matter who announces it. It doesn't matter um, which government's in power. The question is, are we forging a consensus which can last? I think, as we look forward, that's the kind of consensus we need to forge in so many areas. David's book sets out the analysis and the ideas and his challenge to politics to come together and actually deliver is a challenge well made. David, I wonder if we should start with the challenge that you've thrown down to economists of, uh, of all kinds and whether you think that Ed has entirely picked that up. Um, well, I think he's picked it up and I, th I think he made a very fair point, which was that actually uh, the government um, of which he was a member, uh, I think they didn't strictly uh, uh, stick to mm. neoclassical thinking and in fact did some extremely sensible things through the enterprise and growth team uh, which I as Minister of Science and Innovation benefited mm -hmm. hugely from uh, and in fact that uh, obviously developed my own thinking so I think that has to be put in uh, put into the discussion having said that I do think uh, neoclassical uh, economic thinking which is what is taught pretty much to every economic student in England and in, in America uh, has not been helpful to, to some of these uh, discussions because it does really have a number of things built into it which are just simply 
uh, wrong and unhelpful. So this point about uh, really you don't think about the capabilities of firms at all. You think of them just as the representative firm. Uh, this, this idea of perfect competition, which, which says everyone is really a price taker um, and competitive advantage doesn't exist. Everyone is, it's like the, the market in gold. Everyone is selling the same product at the same mm. price. I think this does confuse things. Um, and it certainly makes people think of the economy as just one sector, which has one level of productivity. And as I think the figures I've produced show, mm. that, is, that is a very mistaken view of the economy. Um, a lot of these things turn on different uh, levels of value added and competitive advantage in different sectors. And if your theory ignores that, uh, then I think you come up, um, uh, you just make the mistakes of not understanding what is driving things in different parts of the economy. Mm. Ed, you're actually teaching a lot of students at the moment, Harvard and, 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 and King's. I mean, do, do you accept that challenge? I think the truth mm. is, if you start studying economics, as a, uh, an A-level student or as a first year undergraduate. That's where you begin. You learn the very basic models of neoclassical economics. You learn about perfect competition and how markets mm. clear. And, um, and if that's where you stop, then that would give you a pretty narrow warped view of the world. And maybe um, the, the part of what happened politically, if you go to, to Milton Friedman, who actually was a brilliant economist and did some hugely innovative things in the 50s and 60s around um, consumption and around unemployment. He then in the 70s became more of, a, of a, um, an advocate for a particular view of how markets work and, um, and also broader liberal, um, right of centre liberal political values in which the idea of you know, the free market became sort of central. But the economics I learned, once I got beyond the first few weeks, was about why those simple stylized free market mm. models don't reflect the world. And you learn about oligopoly and monopoly and power and the way in which um, um, that can distort things. But you then also learn about how you have frictions in markets and why they don't clear. And then you learn about how economies can get stuck in different equilibria, which, you know, a good equilibrium, a bad equilibrium, you can get stuck and the market doesn't take you to the better outcome. And then you learn about how governments can do things to make the, the economy work better. And then you also learn, um, and you should learn, about how governments can do things badly, which can make the, um, the uh, uh, make economies work badly. And the challenge is always, if you take David's analysis, which I agree with, which is markets by themselves often produce suboptimal outcomes, Government has to do certain things to make markets work in a competitive way, but also to make sure that you get around problems of free market f uh, failure or um, free riders so that uh, you get the levels of investment you need in skills or in infrastructure, which wouldn't be provided simply by the market system. But governments also have to make sure that they don't start doing some of the things which then start to make things worse. And, you know, there was a view yeah, in the 1970s worse, think, industrial you, you, policy, you need, which yeah. was bad. You need governments to make markets work well. You need a certain degree of, of intervention. Is, but, but as David says think, in his book, yeah. without trying to pick the individual product or firm yeah. and somehow think that governments are more insightful and far-seeing mm. than, um, than, 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 um, uh, than, than just leaving things to the free market. So the free market fails, governments can fail too, and finding the right kind of government to deliver better market outcomes is really, really hard. And that's what we, I think, have been struggling to do all of our professional lives. But the only thing Ed, I'd say is, I mean, if, um, uh, you know, if, if, if it was that really a neoclassical economists um, in our universities understood this issue about competitive advantage and so on, uh, it seems to me they should be saying that, and it shouldn't be left to a person like myself, who's not an economist, to have to point out uh, that the reason for the productivity puzzle is that different sectors um, are behaving in different ways related to their competitive advantage. I mean, it, that should be something that um, everyone understands. And I, I think that is because people religiously stick to this, this model of perfect competition 
uh, and it just isn't true. It, it isn't, uh, it isn't uh, uh, a market like that. It's one where competitive advantage uh, is the reality. I, I accept that challenge, and I think economics has got to do better. Until Jeremy Corbyn became the leader of the Labour Party, I'd never been described as a neoliberal before, um, yeah. because, I, because that was never how I thought about the world. And then until this moment, I've never actually been, been accused of being a neoclassical before. But, you know, it's, it's important to push back. And uh, I'm not equating in any way the two people making the charge. Mm. Yeah. So if you look back on your, on your time in government, what... Um what now would you do differently in, in, to, to, to crack this, these kind of issues that we're talking about? I think, um, well, when we came into government in 1997, there was some philosophical argument to be had. There were people in the Treasury who thought it wasn't government's role to try and think about research and development or innovation or to worry about the strength of our export sector. They, the kind of people who thought the word competitiveness was a dirty word. Um, but I think, in general, that wasn't the mainstream view in the Treasury which we inherited, and I don't think that that was um, how the government thought about economics. The reality was, if you take skills policy, it wasn't, in the end, not thinking skills policy mattered, or thinking, no, but we can take a neoclassical view and leave it to the market. It was that, faced by vested interests, which were either departments, or particular parts of the, the sector who had an old-fashioned vested interest stuck in the mud view and resisted, politics sometimes has to take on those arguments. I think those are the things which got in the way more than an analytic failure. So, the, so the, these are obstacles outside, if you like. These weren't things that you uh, think, looking back, we should have done. It's just, I mean, I, I was asking you about what you, what you would have done looking back. Um, seeing how entrenched these problems have been, and, and, and you've given oh, me an answer about the wonderful vested interests, which are, the, the, which the, are always in camp there. Look, all I was saying was that, um, that governments can fail because they have mm. the wrong analysis, or because they are timid in the face of mm. people who don't want change, or because they are just short-termist and make mistakes, or they have too many other things on and lose focus. And we made some mistakes right across that range of areas, so some were analytic, some were just time. Some were, but if you take something like adult skills, mm. I think there is a um, there's elements of all of those in. I mean, it was a failure. Mm. But if you take, I mean, da I think David may not fully agree with me, with, me, with me on this, but I think ducking Tomlinson was a mistake. In the end, that happened because there was a business view which is they mm. didn't want change, mm. and there was a certain wing of the schools world which mm. didn't want change. And even though pretty much every person in government and education did want change, um, the Prime Minister decided they didn't want it, and therefore yeah, we didn't do it. That's now, really that, that's not, yeah, I just don't think you can blame the example. classical economics for that. Yes. But I think just, just moving away from, from the Labour government a moment from this, yeah. um, uh, where I think you can see the neoclassicals or model totally breaking down and, being, and being, uh, just not being able to explain the situation was in the financial crash. Uh, because it, it um, you know, people say, well, actually, the economists didn't predict it. That, that I don't think is a, is a fair criticism because unless you were very close to what was happening, um, it would have been very difficult to predict it. What I think is extraordinary and, and is a, 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 a very fair criticism of the economics profession is that after the crash, when it was quite clear what were the institutional failings, still the economics mm. profession doesn't say what the causes are. And, it, and because, and the reason for that, is that really institutions do not play any part in neoclassical uh, kind of thinking. So when faced with a financial crash, uh, people said, well, you know, uh, we, we can't think of an explanation. If you understood about institutions uh, and understood about banks' balance sheets and um, uh, what the banks were doing in terms of uh, the amount of equity, it was very clear uh, what, what went mm. wrong. And I think that is a criticism, of well, fair criticism of neoclassical economics. Well, so it's, it's definitely a fair criticism. I'm not totally sure whether you could blame neoclassical economics. But in the end, non-executive directors of the big banks with a fiduciary duty didn't see what was going on in the institutions which they were supposedly stewarding 
We have done big institutional change, making the Bank of England independent, regulating for an independent statutory financial services authority. In the end, neither the regulators or the bank dug deep enough into what was going on. What I'm saying is I'm just not sure you can blame economics for that. I mean, no, there's no, lots I, of institutional I, I, change, I, but the institution has failed. No, no, I, I, wasn't, I, I mm. wasn't blaming um, uh, in that sense. Uh, because, I, as I say, I think it was difficult to predict. But subsequently, when the Queen asked, you know, why, why did it go wrong, uh, mm. the, the economics profession should have been able to say, look, it went wrong for these three institutional reasons. And they were institutional reasons. Because neoclassical economics really doesn't see institutions playing any part in this. Uh, it just f failed to have an explanation. And for something as, as serious as a financial crash, I think that is, that is mm. a criticism. Mm. What about some of the answers to this? And it, it sounds as if skills, uh, which we've begun to talk about, is one of the areas where you uh, very closely agree with David. I think so. Well, I'm not totally sure. Um, I, the funding of adult skills has been, especially in the last 10 years, woeful, but we didn't do enough. Um, there hasn't been enough focus on high-end um, technical qualifications, and David's report um, addresses that. I think he's also worried about some of the institutional delivery questions. But the reason I mentioned Tomlinson was because in the end, forcing um, schools and young people to choose between an academic GCSE A-level track or a, um, you know, a technical track worries me. And I think that is where we're going to be as a result of the kind of government reforms which are on the table at the moment. We will still have that bifurcation. And I think in our system, that still leaves you open to the, the risk of, of second class technical well, education. I, well, I, 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 think that, I don't think that is right, actually. I mean, the, if you look around the world, every, every country has pretty much an academic and a technical education route. Uh, they vary when people split off, and that's very important. Uh, they vary about whether people can switch between the two, which is also very important. Um, but that's not why our technical education um, is, is bad because of the split. It's bad because um, you need three things to have a good, really good technical education system. If, if you look around the world, say, who's got a good technical education system, uh, and they have three things. The first is they have a national system of qualifications, which everyone understands. I said, if you're going to do that job, this is the qualification. Uh, you have what is in the qualification is set by industry. So everyone knows that if you take that course and then you go to industry and say, I've got this course, you will get appointed rather than another person yeah. uh, mm. because you've got those skills. If you have, as we have had, a system where there are so many qualifications, I mean, there are 24 qualifications that were for plumbing. Um, no one knows what quality they are, how good they are. The poor kid goes and gets a qualification, takes it along to an employer, and the employer says, I've no idea it's, whether it's this is good or bad. Yeah. Not surprisingly, kids say, well, what on earth is the point of this? Yeah. Um, so you've got to have a national system of qualifications which works in the marketplace. We've never had that. Um, over the whole century, we've been looking at that. Um, for better or worse, that's what we now put in, is being put in. And it follows what other countries do, and I think that's what will give prestige uh, to uh, T-levels. Is a, te a technical... Are uh, qualifications necessarily seen as second class? I mean, if they, if, if, if they, if they had the rewards in, 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 uh, that employers um, you know, really value them, as David's been describing. Uh, well, I think that the, um, the reality in the past is that people have t taken the view that once you go down the, the, um, the technical route, there isn't the option to switch back into the academic route, um, that we make those decisions very early, and... Um, the consequence is that the message which um, young people get in school from teachers, head teachers, careers advisors, universities and parents is you know, stay on the academic track and go to university. And um, the, the diploma, which I was um, part of trying to introduce, was everything David described. I mean, in the end, 
it failed because the take-up was too low. But it was going to be a national qualification. It had been designed by industry. I remember being on a visit with a head of a sixth form, an FE college IT department saying it's terrible, this qualification. We won't be able to teach it in the IT department. They're making us do it jointly with business studies because apparently they've got to apply IT in the world and that's not what we teach. And the business guy who was actually from Vodafone said, but that's what we've always wanted to hire. And the, diplo the idea with the diploma was you would be able at 14 to set off down that track, knowing that within that, you could choose to bias yourself in a more academic direction, go to university, or to take this more technical route. Everybody would do maths and English, and in the end, you'd come out with a, with a qualification which would be national and have the same parity and where people could move between the two. Mm. And the reason why, in the end, it failed was because the government said, no, we're going to keep A-levels as the gold standard, but we'll have this diploma as well. And the schools thought, well, you know, but so it's not going to be as good. Mm. And in the end, what did Michael Gove do as Education Secretary in 2010? The first thing he announced was he was only going to give you the English back if you had certain GCSEs, and in which music, drama, um, design technology, mm. sport, anything technical was all classified as second class and not in the English baccalaureate. So this is deep in our system, and everything David's doing, I think, is right. Mm. My worry is, is it enough if we keep telling through schools, kids, don't go the second class route, go the first class route? Well, I think kids will decide for, for themselves. I mean, I think one of the interesting questions to ask is why is A-level got prestige? And I think it's very, it's very clear. First of all, it's a national qualification. Every kid knows that if it wants to go to a good university, it has to do well in A-levels. And if you go to a good university, that's the route into a good, well-paying job. Yeah. And, and that's what, in the end, counts. So I think if, if you can get to a position where you have a T-level, um, and you can take that, it's part of a national qualifications, you know you get a better job uh, if, you, if you have that, then that's what will give, give prestige. And but it I won't be what people are told, it's, in the end it will turn on the fact that you know, a young person goes into a pub and says to a friend, don't do that rubbishy degree mm. at this third-rate university, mm. which won't get you a good job. Come and do this T-level because if you get that, then you'll go mm. to a good... That's what will change. That, that is totally the right approach. When I was Secretary of State, the number of times I went to big companies around the country and you would meet in their early 20s, people who'd gone through the apprenticeship route and ended up with a level four qualification. So they had, they had a university level qualification, they were earning more money, hugely prestigious within the firm, and you said to them, what advice did you have to get to this point? And all of them had done it despite the advice of schools, teachers, careers advisors, often parents, certainly all the message from the universities, who were saying, well, you know, risky, this is what we do in Britain. Mm. We to get A-levels and we go to university. Mm. So uh, everything you're doing I agree with, but what I'm worried about is you send a signal to 12 and 13-year-olds first class, second class, and the second class route never, second class in inverted commas, because it's not second class, you earn more money going to do the technical yeah, well, route that, in many you know, cases. That, that, that may, may uh, count in the end and get rid of uh, the, the, the British disease you're describing, if you like, or the, the British prejudice. D David, it's, it's, it's unfair to ask you, uh, as you've written a whole book on this, of, um, right. uh, to uh, give in a, in a nutshell the things you'd like the government to do, but I want to get on to the excellent questions we've, we've, we've had sent in. So what would be your... your um, Parting shot, if you like. Well, I, th I think um, what my book mm. in the end says is that the engine, engine of economic growth is, mm. is innovation. That can be innovation in production methods or it can be innovation in product, which gives you competitive advantage. And so the policies you have to develop are those that uh, encourage uh, innovation. Mm. Uh, and they're pretty obvious. They're R&D, um, uh, they're skills. Mm. Uh, I think corporate governance is, is um, uh, very important because we've, we've managed to produce uh, a corporate governance system uh, and particularly linking remuneration to share value, uh, which is totally counterproductive to mm. investment and innovation, uh, which is why in America you're seeing this appalling amount of share buybacks uh, 
uh, which is all about getting the price, the, the, the share price up, nothing to do with investing long term and, and innovation. Mm. And then I think um, uh, the, other, the final area is this question of regional levelling up. Mm. Uh, because what I think my book shows, and which uh, further work I think shows also, is uh, the problem we have in the regions um, is we do not have enough high value added companies. Uh, we've often replaced uh, de declining industries with uh, very low value added jobs in distribution centers. And you will only change that if you get high value added uh, businesses into those areas. Mm. So that's about how do you get more R&D into the regions, mm. um, uh, get the training up. Mm. And I think also uh, give mayors the ability to uh, create the right environment in their cities um, mm. to encourage uh, high value added businesses. I mean, to take one enormous, extraordinary thing, um, you would have thought that running a city, uh, one of the fundamentals was that the person running it had control over both spatial planning and transport. I, mm. uh, that seems to me so obvious. If you take a place like Manchester, uh, spatial planning is done by essentially local authorities uh, across Manchester and transport is done by the Ministry of Transport. Mm. Now this is no kind of way to run a major city. Mm. So that's an mm. area you've got to get mm. uh, right. Mm. And uh, only if you do that can you begin to get some of the, uh, particularly cities, where they were based on one kind of industry. Mm. Uh, that industry is in decline and replace it with new high value added uh, industries. Mm. Uh, I, 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 there's one ex example of this which I think is really interesting, which is if you take Bradford and Leeds, which are 10 miles apart, uh, Leeds is much more, has much more wealth than Bradford. Mm. So what, what is this due to? Well, it's, it's due to the fact that Bradford was the great wool cloth. It was the place famous for worsteds. Um, and uh, Worcester is not the place to be if you want high value added industry mm. these days and it struggled to get out of that. Leeds was always more um, uh, diverse, it went into, pr it had some Worcester but it also had printing, tanning um, and other things and the result of that is it's moved into IT, financial services and other things and that's what you've got to repeat Mm. Um, but it's, mm. the problem is, how do you take cities and get them to reinvent themselves mm. with high value added mm. uh, businesses? Um, mm. That's the challenge. Um, again, it's not a challenge that neoclassical economics understands mm. at all because it thinks all industries pretty much have the same uh, mm. productivity. Mm. We could have a whole session just on that, on the cities or on innovation. But actually that leads uh, directly into our first question. Hello. I'm Professor Linda Yu, an economist at Oxford University, LSC, Ideas, and the London Business School. My question for Lord Sainsbury is this. Like the United States, the UK has done well in some tech sectors, for instance, fintech, but it doesn't have a significant advanced manufacturing sector. So these are industries which have high levels of technology and R&D and skills. That's grown well in the United States and it's why there's been reshoring manufacturing which has returned to US shores. So my question is, what needs to be done in the UK to upgrade manufacturing into advanced manufacturing? David, David you want to take the room just talking about it? Yes, I um, well, I, I would want just to say first that I don't think there's quite as much reassuring as, as the mm. question implies, mm. uh, because reassuring, reassuring is um, used in two different ways. One is bringing, actually bringing manufacturing back uh, from China or wherever to America. Um, there's very little of that, I think. Uh, and then there's reassuring, which is reassuring profits. Uh, because the Americans had a system where uh, it was tax advantageous to keep your profits offshore, um, and which they did in huge quantities. Uh, the, the tax law was changed and they brought the profits back to, uh, to America. That doesn't change anything really in terms of competitiveness. 
And where, where people are moving things, they're not moving them from China to America, they're moving them from China to Vietnam. Mm. Mm. So uh, I think one must be a bit careful about thinking that's um, uh, really working. Mm. In terms of bringing it back, um, uh, how do you turn it into advanced manufacturing? We know how you do that. Uh, uh, you do it by having institutions to diffuse innovation and knowledge to businesses. Uh, that's what we did uh, in uh, our agriculture for many, many years, and we have the highest productivity uh, in agriculture. Uh, then Mrs. Thatcher uh, abolished ADAS, and we now don't have high-level productivity. So the way you do that um, is to have organizations diffuse technology. And when I was in government, I set up something with the enterprise and mm. growth team, uh, which was called a manufacturing advisory service, which was just this, which was people with a lot of manufacturing experience going into small businesses and saying to them, look, you could do quality mm. control, you could do lean manufacturing. Mm. Um, and of course, that was then abolished by Sevit Javid, mm. of no doubt, um, on the argument, well, you know, rational businessmen know what they need and should pay for it. Mm. And we're now left in a position which we haven't got an organization to do this at just the moment when you really need it, because we're coming up to a period where Industry 4 uh, is really important. Uh, industry 4 is the digitalization mm. it's of, of uh, mm. industry. And pretty well every major uh, advanced country has a program uh, for raising mm. the level of knowledge mm. It, it, it's about diffusion, it's not about research, it's about diffusion of these techniques to mm. industry. Mm. Uh, what do we have? We have mm. one experiment in the Northwest, uh, done by a LEP, which is quite an inadequate body to do this. Mm. And that's one experiment. Every other country has a perfectly good cross-national system uh, of diffusing these new techniques to industry. So that's mm. what you have to do. That's great. We're now going on to a question from Gemma Tetlow, Chief Economist at the IFG. I'm Gemma Tetlow, Chief Economist at the Institute for Government. This government has big ambitions for both more active industrial policy and reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions. In your book, you suggest that government can and should actively intervene to promote innovation. Would it make sense for this government to do this to promote a shift to greener technologies? And if so, how could policy be designed to do that effectively? David, what do you think at that point? This is an um, extremely good um, question. And I think... Um, uh, there are some very clear policies that um, government can adopt uh, to encourage uh, green products and green energy uh, and so on. Um, they're pretty, pretty obvious ones. Um, first of all, there is sporting uh, technology. Um, for example, if you have wind turbines, mm -hmm. um, just sporting the development of this generic technology is, is an important thing for governments to, to do. And you only got to look at the incredible uh, increase in efficiency of wind turbines to see how uh, good this can be. Uh, the second thing you need to do is, of course, uh, when you start with suddenly these new technologies, um, is to have feed-in tariffs. I, you need to give them uh, very high tariffs to take off mm. the electricity uh, so that they can then build up um, to get the competitive advantages. Um, and of course, some countries have done this extremely well. The, the people, by and large, um, sadly, they're in um, Asia. Um, so that if you take uh, solar energy, which was invented in, in, Calif in America, uh, the first market for it was in um, California, uh, that uh, solar panel industry is now almost entirely in China, with a bit in Germany, uh, because they did that, of mm. feed-in tariffs. And uh, feed-in tariffs in the context of climate change was mm. stopped by the oil and gas and coal industry in America, uh, which is why solar power is now going to be mm. in Baoting uh, mm. City in China. So those are things you can do. And what do you think the government here, uh, the UK government, should do now? Well, I think that they should... Um, uh, obviously, there's another stage in um, wind turbines, mm. uh, which... Uh, I think the government is looking at uh, encouraging this. And, and there's a second stage, which is you can go into deep waters uh, with it. Um, 
and there is technology to be developed for, for that, so there's, that's an issue. And again, uh, feed-in tariffs are important. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, tidal power is actually something the government uh, should look at because, um, in fact, we have the best... We have, we're very good at wind in, in mm -hmm. England. We also um, are very good, in fact, in potential for tidal power. Mm. Um, and actually, of course, tidal power is... Uh, related to some of the areas where you would like to see uh, economic development. Mm. And you might include in it as well, as well nuclear power. No, I, I'm not sure that's the thrust of the question, but uh, well, the, nuclear the government... Well, nuclear power is another area. Yeah. And of course, um, I think also green products um, is an interesting um, area. Um, and there you can use, um, uh, for example, public uh, purchasing or uh, what we developed in government, which was the um, SBRI scheme, which was model on America, where you use, uh, creatively use uh, government purchasing uh, to encourage um, mm. uh, products. Uh, it, that was very much related to um, products which um, government wanted, but you could use it for um, uh, green products as well. Mm. Um, and actually, while we were in government, we did also a scheme uh, with a design council. Um, I mean, this is just thinking about it in answer to this question, uh, in which we subsidised. We have very good designers in this country, and we subsidised them to help small businesses design new products. Um, I think you could, you could devise a very interesting product, which if people came up with ideas for green products, you could um, bring in the design um, in industry um, with some kind mm. of subsidy uh, to help small businesses design uh, mm. new green products. So there are a mm. lot, lot of things you can do. Uh, the the, mm. the tragedy is, by and large, they're being done in Asia now rather than in this country. Mm. And this is a classic example where, um, where markets can't deliver. There are clear market failures, mm. both about the provision or the protecting of a public good, um, the, the climate and the safety of the planet, but also mm that we can't see the future. We don't have perfect foresight and markets to be really efficient need to see the future and of course we can't. Um, so you have to have a government role. Mm -hmm. And the question then is, what is the government's role and what risk of government failure do mm -hmm. you run? Because if the, the, if, if the solution is the funding of basic research, well, that's straightforward. But once you get into very powerfully interventionary, regulatory rules, mm. tax-based mm. uh, incentives, which are based upon mm. trying to foresee the future, which we can't, the chance of getting it wrong. I mean, the, we're, we're talking here in a way about the thing that both of you have you know, rightly decried, which is the government picking winners or picking you know, winners of technology and saying, look, exactly. we're going to back this or, 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 um, and, and not that. When we were in the Treasury in the, the early 2000s and I was there, we were, we were concerned about the amount of money we were about to spend on renewables and there was a lot of scepticism about the ability of technology and then industry to meet um, the thresholds being set and they've been hugely surpassed mm. and actually the technology has done a great job and so mm. that money was very much not wasted but mm. it's quite easy to waste mm. money on punts which don't work out and mm. you know as you move from the general principle or the here and now to trying to spend large amounts of money to punt on the basis of picking a particular future. I mean, governments are often not very, very good at that. And mm. um, if, they, if they do it badly, they waste a lot of money. If they do it badly, you can see all the advances th going elsewhere. So I, th I think what I say in the book, which I think is, is the good rule, which is don't try and pick companies and don't try and pick products, because that is requires a granular kind of knowledge which you simply never have in, in government. But pick, picking technologies and picking sectors yeah. where you can see things happening, their governments actually have quite a good record of supporting it. But don't try and pick companies and don't try and pick yeah. uh, products because you'll never have enough granular knowledge to, yeah. to make Even decisions. Even picking technologies, I mean, you know, some of, some of the early commitments to some of the renewables um, were very, very expensive. It just it then happened that because of that, the price came down. Yeah, um, but if you look at uh, wind turbines yeah. in this country and you look yeah. at solar um, uh, in the Far East, mm. um, the winners are 
the people who actually made those the governments who made those bets. Mm. Would you say the same for nuclear? Um, well, I think nu um, nuclear. There's so many <laughs> issues. Um, the, the, uh, who the, has the, been the, There are, but it, but it, but it is. You know, it is. It is an example of what we're talking about, where, where governments um, uh, tried to pick a version of the future, or tried to get into it early. Indeed, the UK was uh, was one of those. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, I mean, it's it's true of companies as well mm. as it's true of um, governments. Um, mm that if you're going to innovate, you don't always get mm. it right. Mm. Um, the question is, do you get it mm. right enough? Um, if you don't try, you, mm. you, of course, you're not in the game at all. Mm. Um, and that's true of business as, as in government. Mm. Mm. Let's go to our final question, which is from Giles Wilkes, the Senior Fellow at the Institute for Government. This is Giles Wilkes. I'm Senior Fellow at the Institute for Government. I've been here for about a year, but I've had great pleasure working with you, going back to being a special advisor for Vince Cable and Theresa May too. And I've got a question that goes back in time a little bit too. I mean, you've been steadily advising governments for over 20 years about the importance of a certain way of thinking about policy, about clusters and innovation, you know, understanding how place and research are entwined, probably long before academic superstars like Ed Glazer and Gina Moretti. Now, do you think that governments have heard you but failed to execute or just not listened hard enough? I mean, has your thinking changed over 20 years? Because I've been reading about your knowledge economy work under Mandelson, and I, I keep this book of yours by the desk to help me with my industrial strategy work. And I'm interested to know what your theory for why it's still a problem is. I, I think the answer to, to this is a whole that this is where uh, people have been blinded by, uh, to go back to our subject of neoclassical economics. Um, and I can give you an example of this. Um, I mentioned that we, when I was in government, um, we did introduce, with the Enterprise and Growth Team, a scheme called the Manufacturing Advisory Services, which was modelled on, in fact, um, manufacturing extension partnerships in America which has been a very successful scheme, uh, diffusing manufacturing knowledge to small businesses. And we introduced the manufacturing advisory services, uh, which worked very well with experts going into small businesses and, and improving their productivity. And then that was abolished um, by Savid Javid, uh, as I say, on the grounds that I assume uh, that uh, businessmen know, because they're rational managers, know what technology they need, and therefore should pay for it. Um, and that means we're now at a, at a significant disadvantage. So I think this is where neoclassical economics, which says, look, you should never, never mm. get involved in this. It's, it's rational managers who know what the risk and rewards of, of everything is. Um, uh, you should not interfere in that. And I think that's a mistake because um, I've been in, um, I was a long time in industry. And if there's one thing I learned, that one was not dealing as a whole uh, with rational managers who mm. knew the risks and rewards of each course of action. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fantasy world. And this is where I think government can help. Mm. And Giles also asked whether, whether your thinking has changed over 20 years. Um, over 20 years, um, well, I think, I think um, the particular views I've held um, probably haven't changed. Um, it was only, I think, um, actually after I came out of government mm. that um, I began to think to what extent they actually related uh, to uh, economic theory. Um, because I had done these things all on the basis of what I'd seen in other countries and what I knew worked from being in industry. And it was only when I came out of government that I started thinking of them uh, in terms of what is the theoretical economic position. Mm. And they seem to be completely in conflict with the kind of economic mm. thinking. And that's when I sat down and wrote the book. Well, I guess um, if I think of the of Sajid Javid's decision there, or Michael Gove abolishing building schools for the future, or educational maintenance allowances, many other things when he became Secretary of State took over for me in 2010, it just feels a bit unfair 
to blame neoclassical economics for what was actually a change of government with new people coming in and thinking, let's rip it all up and do it a different mm. way so that we can have our own pl blueprint and get the credit. I'm just not sure that I think that was driven by some big economic theory. But my learning is that it's partly my fault because I think one of the things that I have changed my view on and, um, and I feel reading David's book that he probably shares some of this as well is that there is too much discussion of difference and division and we don't work hard enough to try and bring people in and forge a common view which then lasts mm. through time and maybe that um, the Labour government didn't do enough to persuade Sajid that the um, MAC was a good thing and maybe I didn't try hard enough to put Michael Gove in a position where he had to join our consensus and you know I grew up in a time in the 70s when consensus was a dirty word but it's the only thing which lasts the things which become consensual and if we can forge some consensuses on the idea in David's book then the world will be a better place. Well there is quite a lot of agreement on this though it is quite a long time since there was a Labour government now. Um, do you think, uh, do you see the makings of consensus on this? Um, well, I, I would like to think that that could be, because I, I don't think um, it takes up as, it, it's, first of all, it, it's basically mm. a, a book which is uh, based on market, a view that the market is, the, is the, how you should base your economies. So it's based on a market view of economies. Uh, but it does say, uh, there is a role for government. This is rather, it's not the kind of uh, extreme labour view of directing industry, it's enabling industry. Um, and I would like to think that you could get consensus around that uh, sort of view, uh, mainly because, of course, if you look around the world, uh, that's what the successful countries are doing. I mean, they, they are doing it on the basis mm. of market economies uh, where uh, government plays a big role in supporting uh, the companies and enabling them to do things by R&D and so on. And that really should be something uh, that you can get a large measure of consensus about. It's also the case there's not been a Labour government for 10 years, but at the last election in 2019 there was clearly not a consensus mm. on these matters between the parties. And whoever wins the next election, I think will be a be in a better place for the next 10 years if around some of these ideas there is a cross-party consensus such that a change of parliament doesn't mean a change of approach and throwing everything out of the window because that's just very destructive. On that we're going to have to stop and we're some way off the next election so we've, uh, we've still uh, we've got time to see on that. Thank you all very much indeed for listening. Thank you for the very good questions sent in.